I'm having breakfast in the delightful Riverview Hotel in Bagan after arriving last night. As the sun rises and the river traffic increases, I have that good to be alive feeling. The buffet breakfast is good. The location, straight out of a Kipling novel, and alongside me, the Irrawaddy, that renowned road to Mandalay, making its way from Mandalay to the sea. This is my second visit here, and I wanted to shoot it in 4K. The hotel, beautiful and peaceful. The staff and facilities, excellent. The pool and gardens having a traditional design and using local materials. And the location, right in the middle of everything. The horse and cart being the way to go. I hired one for the day and I was soon heading toward the famous temples. The morning sun in January, very pleasant. How old are these temples? How many are there? During the height of the kingdom of Pagan, between the 11th and 13th centuries, there were over 10,000 Buddhist temples, pagodas and monasteries in the Bagan Plains alone, of which, believe it or not, over 2,200 temples and pagodas still survive to the present time. Some a thousand years old, that's why it's one of the main tourist destinations in Burma, perhaps even in Asia. The Ananda Temple is first stop. It's the most famous of all the temples, built in 1105. The spire was gilded on its 900th anniversary in 1990, and it's highly revered in Burma. It houses four standing Buddhas, each one facing the cardinal directions of north, south, east and west. The temple is said to be a fusion of Mon and Indian styles of architecture. It's a fascinating place with some interesting architectural styles. There's a legend about the building of this temple. Eight monks who approached the king seeking alms described to him the Nandamula cave temple in the Himalayas where they had meditated saying it was so beautiful. The king, pleased with their description, asked them to build a temple in the middle of the Bagan plains that created cool conditions within. After the monks finished constructing the temple, the king, wishing to retain the uniqueness of the temple, you guessed it, he had the monks killed to ensure that no similar temple could be built elsewhere. Thus its design is unique. The next temple I visited was the Tatbinyu Temple, or the Omniscient built in the mid-12th century and adjacent to the Ananda temple. And outside was a bell. These bells are often rung when a Buddhist comes to pray. There are many temples here, and yet each one is distinct in its own way. Whenever I'm in an ancient site that is thus preserved, I always wonder what went on here down the centuries. I also marvel at the way they even managed to build such large and impressive monuments that after hundreds of years still impress. In 
inevitably among the temples of the tourist shops. Though some of them contain the usual tourist stuff, there are some local ethnic handicrafts for sale. my first day, but an intriguing experience. The next day I decided to try, which for me was a first, an electric bike. These electric bikes are a lot of fun. They cost one dollar an hour. The battery will last all day and uh, they enable the tourists to get around and see everything even on the small little tracks. You'll notice they're also quiet so I set off to explore on my own cheaper than a horse and cart quicker and with the freedom to go where I want. Every now and then coming across the tourist shops that surround the temples. Clothes and handicrafts being the main things to buy. Next place, the Tilomindo Temple, surrounded by trees and shops, and a very nice place to stroll around. The low cost of living here, coupled with low wages, means the cost of these goods is relatively low. I get to walk around a near thousand year old temple whilst doing some window shopping and occasionally get to meet local people who spoke a little English. This is really an excellent place to visit. When Rudyard Kipling in Letters from the East wrote about Burma in 1898, he said it will be quite unlike any land you know about. 120 years later is still true. The Shui Zigon Pagoda is one of those places, even in Burma, where its location and architectural beauty still amaze the traveler. Right on the banks of the Irrawaddy River, my first visit here was actually by boat, this time on my electric bike. It really is an enigmatic and beautiful place. Clearly Buddhist, it's ornate pillars and statues showing that. Its spires and stupas dominant, and everything appears to be clad in gold and shining in the clear sunshine. One might even say majestic 
an earthly symbol of a spiritual belief. But on closer examination, there are traces of animist spirit worship and beliefs that predate Buddhism, but are still alive and now integrated into the Buddhist form of worship here. So we see chins and other mythical creatures standing guard. Though since my last visit, the nets have been removed and apparently reside in a small hall nearby. King Anurata, who reigned from 1044 to 1077 and who was converted to Theravada Buddhism by monks, initiated its building starting around 1059. Legend states that he chose the site by sending out a white elephant with a tooth relic of the Buddha attached to it. He said, wherever the elephant stopped and bowed down would indicate the site for the building of the pagoda. The elephant finally stopped over a sand dune and hence the name Shwezigan Pagoda, which means Pagoda on a Dune in Burmese. So it's been here almost a thousand years, though modified, added to, and rebuilt. This is earthquake country, and the pagoda has been damaged by earthquakes and other natural disasters over the centuries and renovated. A notable renovation was during the 16th century. The large earthquake of 1975 caused damage to the spire and the dome that necessitated significant renovation. Now 30,000 copper plates cover the spire gilded between 1983 and 1984 and again in recent times. However, the pagoda's bottom level terraces have remained mostly in their original form. Local people will tell you all kinds of stories about it. It's so large that the sound of a drum beaten on one side of the pagoda cannot be heard on the other side. Also, the Great Pagoda's shadow never falls outside its boundary walls, regardless of the time of day. I have to say I'm very impressed with the beauty of this place. One might say that it surprises the visitor with its splendor. The blue skies, green trees and golden stupas, a kaleidoscope of color. The people here are always a pleasure, though few speak much English. The kids are special. A really fascinating visit and I'm so happy that this place is so photogenic but time to put back on my sandals.
I'm enjoying my time here in this fascinating place. Today I'll take a horse and cart to the river. The plan, a river cruise. I'll hire a boat and indulge myself in one of my favorite pastimes, cruising down the river. And what more delightful place than the legendary Irrawaddy River that flows from north to south all the way through the country, being the country's largest river and most important commercial waterway. Plenty of things to see as it flows south all the way to the Andaman Sea. Here is the Bupaya, a sacred pagoda built by the third king of Bagan that gives great views of the river. Meanwhile, I've negotiated a good price for a boat with the help of my horse and cart driver, and we soon set sail. Now you may think I'm a lucky guy to do this stuff, but I'm taking you with me, so to speak, so you can enjoy it, what's the word now, vicariously, which whilst not being the best, is certainly better than nothing. So if you can't swim, put on your life vest now, and maybe a little sunscreen. Here we go. As you can see, we're both sitting on the same side of the boat. And soon the sights unfold. And I balance the boat. Taking a cruise along the Irrawaddy has become popular in recent times, and river boats such as this managed to charge exorbitant rates. That is, 1,200 US dollars per person for a four-night cruise. Ouch. The boat gives the opportunity to get a glimpse of the people on the riverbank getting on with their lives. At the same time, the commercial boats get on with theirs. This boat pushing a giant barge. Looking one way, we see the river. Looking the other way, we can see life beside the river. both in contrast to the cruise boats waiting for rich pickings. Rudyard Kipling's poem Mandalay described the river as on the road to Mandalay where the flying fishes play. I've been on the river a dozen times and I'm still to see a flying fish or the famous Irrawaddy dolphin for that matter. If we were to keep going here we'd reach Mandalay in the morning but we're certainly not going that far. We then stopped and moored up to see the 200-year-old Nat Tong Monastery near Old Bagan. Although its date of founding is uncertain, it's probably the region's oldest, as well as the finest wooden monastery. The problem with wooden monasteries is that they don't survive as well as the older brick and stone stupas. The roof avian decorations have been restored and they're beautiful. Visitors can reach here by boat, as I did, or by horse and cart. 
We then resumed our cruise in the evening sun, a delightful time of the day here. As early as the 6th century, the river was used for trade and transport, and it's always busy with all kinds of boats and barges, big and small. And of course, the tourist boats, like the one I'm on. For the serious tourist, this country offers many out-of-the-ordinary sights, sounds and experiences. I've been all over the world, but the thing I always look forward to when I'm here is the boat ride on the Irrawaddy, with the breeze on my face, the sun overhead, and the world passing by. There are times when one thinks that I'm on the sea, not the river. So vast, the expanse of water. So we arrive back. It's ten past five in the evening, and my coachman awaits me to transport me to enjoy the must-have began experience watching the sunset from a high stupa. When we arrive, there are already a thousand people there. And the sun is slowly descending over a myriad of temples and pagodas. At its height in the 11th and 13th centuries, there were 10,000 temples here. Even now, there are still 2,200. The people just sit in silence and enjoy the amazing spectacle. As for me, I'm going to ride the horse and cart back to the hotel, take a shower, and have an al fresco dinner by the river, watching the stars and listening the crickets. Next morning it's another beautiful day in Bagan and the birds were rejoicing in it. Believe it or not, it's already nine o'clock in the morning and I decided against taking a hot air balloon ride. The 45 minute ride costs 345 US dollars upwards per head. My return air ticket from Hong Kong, a two hour trip, just about the same. My advice to tourists, avoid the Irrawaddy cruise boats and the hot air balloons. An easy way to check the weather here, the weather forecasting stone. It was dry and had a shadow, so great weather. These are the gardens in the Hotel River View, which was excellent. There were even some ancient monuments in the garden. I was bemused. Where else on earth can you find a hotel with ancient monuments in the garden? Not many. Mind you, 
I did stay in the Dolmen Hotel in Malta that had 5,000-year-old dolmens in the garden. Here the structures were less than a thousand years old, but certainly stirred up those feelings of wonder that ancient monuments tend to do. Who built this? What was life like here by the river a thousand years ago? What did it look like at the time it was built? Here the Bougainvillea was beautiful. The hotel itself was beautiful. I was on my own, filming, writing, studying, and had just enjoyed breakfast watching the river life amidst nature and history, and blue skies and sunshine the morning sun actually very pleasant. This is my room. How come I came to Bagan? Well, I'd been here before, years ago, and wanted to revisit. But I also wanted to revisit Inley. I flew from Calais in the Chain Hills to Mandalay and actually decided in Mandalay Airport where to go. They said thunderstorms had grounded the Inley flights. So I bought a ticket to Rangoon via Bagan in the airport for about $120. On arriving in Bagan, I got a taxi and told him to take me to the Riverview Hotel walked in and negotiated a price. The next day, the manager upgraded me to a suite. After breakfast, I strolled around the gardens. The pool was no less attractive than the rest of the hotel. The buildings totally in keeping with its historic setting even Burma-style thatch. The setting of the hotel, an excellent oasis before one sets out to explore. Reflections and color creating interesting dynamic art. Surreal at times, certainly emotive. Etching a unique memory on the mind. And all the while, the bird song accompanied the sights. The hotel is surrounded by ancient temples. And even the preferred mode of transport is ancient. So I began another day of discovery in Bagan. I'd hired a one dollar an hour electric bike again, and with camera, map, and guidebook in hand, I began another day of discovery. For me, this was an ideal way to explore and shoot. The guidebook told me to be sure to climb the Shwer Sandor Pagoda. The pagoda contains a series of five terraces topped with a cylindrical stupa, which is topped by a bejeweled umbrella and built by King Anuratha in 1057. Enshrined within the pagoda are said to be sacred hairs of the Buddha. 
It certainly gave a great view over the plain below. The Irrawaddy River in the distance and the hills beyond. This is known throughout the world as one of the unique ancient sites on Earth. One of its photogenic qualities being the views change with the light. And as the day progresses, it reveals different facets. In addition to the views, one gets opportunities to explore individual pagodas and sometimes meet people, and also see some of the intricate handicrafts that the local people create. Next stop was actually the biggest temple, the Mayanji Temple. The thing that was unusual about this temple was that it was home to thousands of bats, which kept up a constant chatter, and which made the remove your shoes rule a problem as bat guano carpets the floor. The temple was built in the 12th century, but paintings inside are more recent, 18th century, and the unusual occurrence of two Buddhas side by side. The standard of workmanship was very high, but there was a good reason why. This stone is where they used to chop off the hands of the workers who did not keep up the standard. If you could put a needle between the stones, the king chopped off their hands. The Buddhist virtue of ahimsa, non-violence, appears to have been selectively applied. Worship of the Buddha continues here. The people here are delightful. This teenage girl was trying to earn money selling souvenirs. She told me she gave what she earned to her parents for the support of the family. She was one of few people that I met who could speak good English. I was blessed to talk with her. I then visited the Suleimani temple, around which were many interesting souvenir stalls. But my main purpose was to take time and get some good shots. The juxtapositioning of nature and history makes for a striking shot. Likewise, light and dark. Their artwork was excellent. So my time is coming to an end. 
I've thoroughly enjoyed the brief visit. The place, the weather, the people, the history, and the culture. Finally, the fun. The bike is five sizes too small. A French girl offered to take a shot of me riding and promised not to laugh. <laughs> she broke her promise. And you can see why. Two hours later, I was on a plane to Rangoon. A great trip. So why don't you travel? Sometimes what you're most afraid of is the very thing that will set you free.